Okay, so uh, I'll do a little bit of history and look at the how FEI developed or has uh, been part of developing a standard for FEI and, and how it's uh, used today and a little bit about uh, the future. It's been a very long uh, process actually, uh, slowly working forward. And uh, then I go into tech technology a little bit more tomorrow and discuss biomechanics of it. So <clears throat> the whole the whole thing kind of started as it, as I would say it does with 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 um, uh, many of big organizations. So this is from the Olympics in Athens, where there were actually three horses that was uh, uh, had uh, career ending injuries, uh, software injuries. And uh, of course not proven, but most likely due to poor surface and poor surface in this sense was, it was inconsistent. So it was a turf that was rather uh, newly installed. So there was simply, <clears throat> the surface simply gave in on some places and horses were, you know, was uneven without or were non-consistent without being able to see anything on the surface. So this is something which is very important, of course. And uh, anyway, that, that made a decision, made the FEI to decide that we need to do something. We need to do some research. The good thing was that, that it, they were not just a quick fix. Uh, they actually financed together with World Horse Welfare. Uh, they um, financed uh, for a start two full PhD studies. And uh, there came in money also from Sweden and from the British Equestrian Federation and others. So there's quite a lot of funding bodies behind this. Uh, but anyway, it, it, was, it was really about evaluating, as you say on the title, evaluating and training and competition surface in equestrian sport. And mainly at show jumping for, for a start, we did it for, uh, for uh, dressage as well. And I'll explain that a little bit later. Uh, but anyway, with high ambitions on, on studying consequences for improved welfare and orthopedic health of the horses that use them. So the two PhD students was uh, Cecilia Lenel, who uh, did an epidemiological study where we, uh, and which of course there is a number of publications telling us something about the training regime. So what she did was to look at, at the diaries uh, from these different uh, places and then follow up uh, also with OBST measurements because this was one of the uh, uh, very early on uh, aims that, that we did. One of the first things, it, it was quite close to, to actually uh, me meeting Mick for the first time. I think we met in 2008 or something like that in, 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 in one of the conferences. Uh, and I came across the, I came across the, the OBSC, which was very lucky for me because uh, honestly, we were having ideas about uh, measuring on horses and, 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 and so on. But the whole aim of FEI was of course, to ultimately create the standard and uh, we realized that it would, it would be a bit of an issue to bring a horse around, a horse around <laughs> to all different tracks around the, the world. And the other thing is that horses adapt to the surface. And there's a lot of things that uh, makes it quite difficult to use it. I know they, they do in actually have in, in Melbourne, they actually use a horse with a special shoe that they canter over the, uh, the, uh, the surface to, try to test it which is pretty interesting. But that's a little bit of a side, side story. Anyway, uh, <clears throat> one of the first thing before I go on, one of the first thing before we even started measuring and things, we actually gathered in, in Uppsala and, and uh, I think Sarah mentioned it all, already and, and Sarah and Alison has been part of this also, and her team been part, part of this from the very beginning. So one of the, the important things, if we're going to measure what we today call functional properties of the surface, with functional properties meaning what does the horse actually feel in a, a little bit simple way to express it, what does the horse feel? Uh, we can 
do that on two different bases. We can do it based on understanding biomechanics, but it's also very important to use words, use terminology that is makes sense to, to, to all the stakeholders. And in this case, not only stakeholders in a question sport, but also in different disciplines, whether we're talking about harness racing or thoroughbred racing or polo or Icelandic horses or, or whatever you want. Because if we actually measure what the horse feels, I like this expression, we <clears throat> should be able to apply that to any, to any discipline, to any activity with horses, right? And of course, that doesn't mean that you want the same surface, <laughs> but this is a horse, <laughs> but you want different, different values on your functional properties. So, so that was a very important thing. And I'll come back to that and explain that uh, very soon. Uh, anyway, back to the PhD thesis. So Cecilia did the one, did, did epidemiology and uh, <clears throat> Elin Handlon uh, did the, basically the OBST validation work and was uh, an important part of, the, of, the, of uh, also some of the publications. Uh, in addition to the white paper, there's also a, a, a more uh, lay person uh, documentation on FEI, which is called a guide to uh, the question surfaces, which I recommend because it's uh, if you want to show people a little bit about what we're talking about in a very simple way. So it's nice with a lot of pictures and <laughs> things like that, <laughs> illustrating everything. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, so 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 one of the important things was uh, well, this this is what we are going to look look at. So the. OBST that I'm using has exactly the same principles. Uh, there are some modifications to it or a, a little bit, which we'll go into details more uh, tomorrow. But anyway, what I will end up with today is explaining what's behind these graphical presentations that we use for testing FEI events. Uh, <clears throat> So what we see here is then five parameters. We call it impact firmness, cushioning, responsiveness, grip, and uniformity. And this is the terminology that I was talking about where we spent quite a lot of time to not to discuss Newtons or Gs or, or <laughs> other uh, physics slash engineering terms because they don't make sense to, to, to any of the yeah. trainers. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and also one of the nice things with, which I will like, like with this, and we can go into that more tomorrow, is really that I'm not saying that these, these, this terminology is valid for as good as possible for all the disciplines, but it was really what we tried to think of things that, that could be used by, by, by any horse discipline. Mm -hmm. It could be possible to explain at least what we mean with it. Uh, and, and this is probably, for many of you, this is uh, say, things that you heard before, but I, I, I want to go through this a little bit before we continue anyway. Uh, <coughs> yes, this is, this is uh, part of the team with each of our <laughs> machines. So it's of course good to meet, meet up. In this case, it's the UK and the Swedish machine. Uh, we didn't bring it, we haven't brought over any from US to the same surface, but really using the exactly the same surface uh, and several machines. It's always an interesting thing when you are a, a, a scientist and really want to know that you measure things. Uh, we might come into to the whole discussion about uh, uh, about uh, calibration of, of test equipment, which of course is very important. But again, I think that's more for tomorrow. Uh, <clears throat> anyway, <clears throat> so the first year was, was spent doing the basic work. And uh, <clears throat> I would say that this is from the London Olympics. And that was the first time that uh, we were involved both with, with, with Sarah Jane's team and, and the Swedish team in both preparations. So this is from 2011, the, the, the year before uh, uh, the Olympics 2012. Uh, and I mean, at this level, 
FEI tend to always have test events like a year in advance, not only to test surfaces, but to test the whole organization, of course. So, uh, uh, yeah, I think, oh, sorry, we'll go for this one first. Uh, so again, I've already mentioned these one, you saw these, these uh, five parameters that we are talking about, the impact, firmness, cushioning, responsiveness, and uniformity. And uh, the way we define this and the way we measure this is impact firmness is about the hoof hitting the ground, just as the hoof make, uh, makes contact. And uh, it's in, 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 in this situation. And it's simply measured by, by, an, by an accelerometer. So measuring the Gs just at the impact. And the whole idea is of course, that the lower part of the OBST is mimicking the hoof, the weight of the hoof, uh, and can be separated from, from what you don't see here, but what you saw on the lab today was, uh, was that we have uh, both a spring and a damper uh, within the system here. And uh, how does the fetlock work if you look in literature? What do we call it? Yeah, we call it a spring damper system or actually the whole, whole limb of the horse. So, so, so uh, our appreciation to, to Mick for coming up with this uh, idea once more you learned about it, you realized there were some thoughts behind it. <laughs> <laughs> not good thoughts, just thoughts. <laughs> Anyway, so <clears throat> I would say this is pretty straightforward and, and simple, but it's also important to understand that, that of course, with this low <clears throat> uh, mass that is hitting the ground first, we are just affecting the very top layer. And this is a concept that I really like, and I like it also from a pure biomechanics perspective and, and looking at, at that, that is... It's two very different things happening as the hoof makes contact to the ground versus when the whole body weight is loading the ground. And uh, I think, uh, no, we can wait with that till later. To, till later. So impact firmness is top layer, it's acceleration as the hoof hits the ground. Uh, Cushioning, we relate to that, and it's always it's been touched upon also by, by, by Sarah and Alice in the previous presentation. That is when we have full weight, a huge mass, but not as much acceleration, of course. Uh, and on that small area of the hoof, it creates a huge, uh, a huge uh, pressure, which of course uh, affects very deep layers. And this is the whole discussion uh, from technology that we technology point of view and what kind of measurements do we use? How do we actually uh, assess what uh, a ton or a, what ton and a half in each stride on uh, the size of a hoof? How that affects deeper, 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 mm -hmm. deeper layers, you know? I, I mean, I encountered such interesting thing with, which I don't think we would pick up any other way with a machine like this, like in, in Wellington was doing going around and doing a number of, of training arenas there and I come to arena and it looks, it looked like a really poor arena. It was not taken care of. It seemed really, really compact and, and, and so on. You went out there, you walked on it and feel, oh, this is going to be crazy, crazy yeah. high. And then I started dropping with the, with the OBSD. And, is there something wrong? Because it was not high. What happened? Well, you know, in, in, in Florida and Wellington, it's 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 old swamp area, everything. So it was so it was of course still water filled clay <coughs> uh, under deepest layer, probably half a meter down. But with the load that we create, with the peak load that we are able to create with that energy that we have in the OBSD, we were able to pick up that. And for sure, of course, the horses will feel this. Yeah, sorry. Uh, uh, I, I think this is always so interesting to, 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 to discuss and think about. So uh, when the cannon bone is more or less uh, vertical, of course, maximum load, and you can also see that the, the, the fat lock is uh, fully compressed here. Mm. 
uh, <clears throat> now we come into a little bit of a, of a tricky thing to, to, to from, from the engineering point of view, and which frustrates some engineers when you start talking about this. And of course, <clears throat> from a functional perspective, the damping of the maximum load from the horse can be achieved both by a surface that has a lot of elasticity or a surface that actually just give, I mean, a dirt track that just creates a big crater. <laughs> or you could have a spring mat, literally a spring mat system. <clears throat> so that's why we're talking about responsiveness. We are not measuring energy return because that gets a little bit difficult with spring and, 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 and damper system. But what we're actually <clears throat> measuring is the 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 the, uh, uh, the frequency of the in this in this situation the hoof round system the natural frequency so you will get to how fast the ground rebounds and we were talking uh, we were talking about this today about measuring I think you and I are, 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 are with, with actually it's quite interesting. I was doing uh, testing for in uh, uh, preparation for the European Championships uh, a couple of years ago in show jumping, and some of the uh, competition was going to be held on uh, on top of a, they're going to put in a top surface on an uh, artificial turf on a soccer field with artificial turf, and we were not really sure about how much top material we would need there, so we started put it in like around two inches and then added on half an inch basically and did OBST tests all the way. And it was so cool and it was interesting because you had the same experience with, with a like, uh, similar situation. Of course, it was very soft and very <laughs> elastic from, from the beginning and it increased the cushioning. I mean, cushioning, the interesting thing with cushioning is that it's not about an optimal value because you don't, you won't have enough you want to have enough cushioning to actually support the hoof, but you don't want to have uh, cushionings where the surface is too compacted because then it gets too too simply too high. And it's actually uh, some of the nice studies from the French people also showing this. And uh, <clears throat> so as we increase the layer, it it increased really much, and then it went down again. And why did it do that? Well, it, of course, it had to do with this with this timing of the natural frequency, actually, of, of the system. Uh, so if you would go into a trampoline that is not set for your weight and your, uh, let us call it, uh, jump uh, frequency on the, on the trampoline, the, the trampoline would kind of kick back before you had decided to jump off. And then it would feel very uncomfortable, stiff, right? So, of course, this is a, a, a difficult concept, and I will go more into also the challenges with how do we measure this in an appropriate for a horse relevant way. But let's save that for tomorrow. Uh, so, uh, this is mostly this is actually I like this is my own <laughs> riding hall. In Sweden, we had a, a, a couple of years where it was very popular to create something that we call rubber ground, uh, which was torn rubber tires, not on top, not in the mix, but underneath the top layer, which create this uh, very, very, I would call it bouncy. I'm not saying it's going to look like this, but I want it, it's difficult to catch on, on a video. Uh, <coughs> uh, so, so sorry, so, so the way we, we measure it is we, we are simply looking at, at the, the load rate or the compression of the spring damper system versus the, the uh, uh, release of it after, afterwards. That's how we look at this frequency. Uh, grip is perhaps more easy to, to, to understand. Uh, it's not so easy to, to measure uh, in a way that uh, is relevant for the horses. And when I say relevant for horses, so this is one of the nice things with, with the whole uh, FEI study. I will explain this a, a little bit more in detail soon. But we did quite an extensive study with with uh, <coughs> with having a, a, a survey measuring the surfaces and interviewing the riders about their opinion on the surface. Not primarily whether it's bad or good, but 
in, in uh, relation to these five parameters. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, since we have the machine in the same way, uh, it's not changed for very, very many years, for 10, 15 years, more or less, it's the same, same machine. Okay, we can use different sensors, we can add or, or remove sensors, and we can work with the analysis. So coming up with new, uh, I spend a lot of my time with trying new approaches to <laughs> improve things. So I would say cushioning and, and impact firmness is simple because it's, um, it's G's and, 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 and Newtons. But the other ones here, when we're talking about responsiveness uh, and grip especially, that's a more challenging, and I think that can still be improved, actually. More about this tomorrow, the technical stuff. Uh, anyway, so here we started out with looking at the, uh, looking at the, uh, uh, how, how long it actually moved in horizontal direction. But we can also use uh, the force comparing, for example, the, horse, uh, the force vertically and, 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 and uh, horizontally. Uh, again, more technical discussion about this tomorrow. Uh, the grip is, of course, in, important in many different situations. When we look at in the show jumping, it's all everything from turning to takeoff to landing and so on. Uh, and, and, and again, <laughs> grip doesn't have one optimal value. We want to have grip that <clears throat> doesn't, allow, doesn't allow the horse to, to or risk the horse to slip. But it shouldn't be too much either because the, the, the small yeah. amount of slide is one of the... Uh, well, the biological mechanism for, for, for actually uh, dampening the horizontal forces when the horse moves over the ground. And I like this one. This, this is actually, I think this movie is actually from <clears throat> here from Keeneland when we, uh, when we did it. But you clearly see how the, thanks to the hoof landing uh, in a slightly oblique angle, you can see that it moves uh, in, a, in a horizontal direction. So you understand that, just looking at this, you understand that it's interesting to look at both position of the hoof and, uh, of course, for force in the horizontal direction. And the uniformity is, is basically just the uh, uh, variance of the four previous parameters over the, over the area. Uh, so that's what we're looking at. Uh, the next important thing that we did, and I think this is, a, this is one of the very important things, uh, and, and which I appreciate very much with the whole FBI study, that was that we went around to 10 different four and five star events uh, and measured all arenas there, not only the competition, but also the warm up arenas. And, uh, uh, tried to interview all but we we got actually a very good uh, i would say good uh, response frequency of, of over 50 percent so it's it's more than uh, actually 600 uh, arena evaluations and since we were doing this on the four or five star level we had the riders who was doing two three or four of uh, these uh, 10 events which made the statistics much more uh, much better because we can go in and look at specific riders but change not in absolute values but in change between arenas and <coughs> what we did was that we uh, we asked them uh, uh, we had a, a, a forum like this one so we were asking about not whether they were good or bad for a start but as I said before first impact firmness was this to the soft or to the more hard side compared to what you used to or what you see on five star level cushioning whether you think this is on the deep side or on the compacted side and so on for responsiveness <clears throat> whether it was was a dead surface or an active surface and grip whether it was slippery or or uh, uh, had a very high grip i mean in i don't know in a question sport, this is something that is uh, very often uh, discussed, and, and writer, some writers have very strong opinion about, oh, this is too grippy, or uh, mostly too grippy. Some some will will don't like it. The thing is that, that <laughs> when they see the arena and they see a lot of fibers in it, they have already decided that it's a grippy arena. <laughs> 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 That's another thing. 
it's very difficult to, to to have them go out riding blindly first to see how it feels. <laughs> but sometimes you would like that. But I think it's also important to note that you were able to talk to them in their language and build the trust with them mm -hmm. and explain the differences between these parameters. You had to be deeply involved in the sport in order to yes. get the responses. And the other thing that I think was most impressive about this is the fact that the different judgments were not correlated. So it wasn't just, this is a terrible arena. It has bad grip, it has bad cushioning, it has bad firmness, and probably not even uniform. You know, those, those, there, was, there was quite a weak correlation. They were distinguishing. And I think that is that you explained the parameters to them, but then you also were dealing with elite riders who were able to make the distinction because of their skill level too. Well, so, so, so from the, inter no, in the interview situation, I had to spend, spend, and I'm, even though they would have text and, uh, and things like that, I would spend uh, quite some time to explain what, what we, how we would like to define this. And then they made the judgment on that. And then of course, the next time the same rider would do it, they would really know just exactly directly. Uh, how they will, would uh, like to characterize the surface. The last question was an overall rating. And <clears throat> so what we could, this is an illustration of this, and what we could do this way was that in this case, we sorted the average value of measured and, and uh, uh, objective, subjective and objective uh, measurement just uh, in, in a, from a magnitude point of view. And what you see here is the, the dots, of course, as you say, subjective evaluation and OBST measurements for each of the parameters, in this case, the impact firmness. And of course, you can see that there is huge difference between what is measured and, 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 and uh, the sure. subjective evaluation, looking at single arenas. But the interesting thing is really that looking at sorting at this, you can see that there is actually quite a, a high, high correlation, the correlation is good. But I mean, if we deal, dive into the statistics, if this, if there wasn't a slope, the steeper the slope is, the more clear is the correlation, of course. Mm -hmm. So, so you, you kind of get a feeling for this if you're some, if you're used to looking at this, but still there is a correlation clear. And I think this is a very important part of, of at all getting some, some traction for this within the API. If we don't measure something that is actually uh, uh, makes sense to, to, to the rider, to the rider slash horses, mm -hmm. uh, we would never be able to continue with this, I think. Yeah. Oh, but it's very good. I, I really like this one. And it looks more or less the same. It's just the slope that is a little bit different. So for impact firmness and cushioning is, is the slope is clear. For the other, it gets a little bit lower. The lowest is responsiveness. Uh, <clears throat> but you can also see it's, 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 very, makes very, it's very clear that it's a big difference between measurements. So we cannot use a, a rider to, to do this measurement. We need this, even though we measure things that they can feel. That is the very important take home message from Just this. Just to understand this, because the, the riders thought, like, for example, the three on the right, the yeah. riders said, oh, it's really firm, but the OBST said it's not really that firm. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. I was like, I think that's what yeah. it means. But, and that, I mean, that's, that is interesting that they feel like it's that much firmer, but I do wonder, like you said, if they, they saw it yeah. and made a judgment before they actually wrote yeah. it. So there is, there is a lot of statistics here, and it's, it's a paper by Elin, which is in, uh, with Elin as a first author, and it's within her thesis as well. Uh, yeah, sorry, that was the, that was the cushioning, cushioning stuff. So, so this, is a, this is, of course, discussing this from a little bit larger perspective. This is, of course, very important uh, to understand what we do today, and when we, based on this, which I kind of said from the beginning, uh, came to thresholds. These thresholds are based on rider opinion today, mm. nothing else, uh, which will lead us to some of the future work later <laughs> that I pointed out right now. Uh, <clears throat> but of course, it's also important from, 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 from a 
a, a confidence and acceptance from the sport and from the uh, from the organization from FEI that we have we have this data. So so how is it used? So when when we started this and and it was a lot of meetings with with uh, with FEI officials and John Roach who was John show jumping uh, director at when this started. He was always nagging on me. Okay, so when do you get me the perfect footing? <laughs> I don't know how many hours I spent to tell him, you will never get a perfect footing. And he, because he had kind of a vision that, well, I mean, on the five star, we can, uh, we can make an artificial footing that we can move around to the 100 uh, shows we have around, basically. I say, that will not... It's not practical solvable, and it it's, that doesn't exist. There are too many things that affect whether you footing is good for a horse. Everything from uh, the the locomotion pattern of the horse, the uh, neuromotor control of the horse, uh, how it's trained before. Well, I mean, horses are extremely adaptable. It's not that horses do not can do work on different kind of surfaces, but especially if if we see like like. Uh, the, the World Cup and the whole high, high competition levels, they compete on different showgrounds around the whole world each weekend. So it's a little bit different from what you're used to here in, in, in US where you have a, a, a show for, for weeks or, or months and then go to another state. These horses go from one show to another within a week. So of course, uh, that's not very difficult to understand from a biological point of view. You need to have some consistency between the surfaces, uh, not to put the horses into too much of a danger uh, in, in risk of orthopedic injuries. So uh, we, we came finally to the conclusion and based on, on actually on this data, we created thresholds instead of creating a perfect surface. Uh, and, uh, but it was quite a, quite a, quite a uh, uh, long actually discussion with, with many of the people within FEI about, about these things. Uh, so then the next thing, the next question is really about uh, how, how is it used well, from the beginning, we had we had a lot of I don't know I don't see my I don't remember which order I put my yeah from the beginning we had very high ambitions with uh, kind of certifying FEI surfaces and that would include a, the, this is one of of uh, of, of mix uh, 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 graphs where where you have the whole actually uh, the whole uh, oh Sarah did that. That's much nicer than what you would have gotten from me. Okay, sorry. Uh, yeah, 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 let's sorry. be clear. That's <laughs> okay. okay, you distributed it. Yeah. Oh, I distributed it, but, but, but she did all the hard work. Yeah, no, that's true. <laughs> so anyway, this is a, a diagram of, of all the <laughs> laboratory tests that we're actually seeing uh, today. That's what you have here. And, and this became more and more and more and more, uh, of course, a, a huge thing and uh, got unrealistic to to do so but this this is partly what it's been why it's been a long process there is of course another thing which has been very very little discussed in the fei and which fei have to to take into a care into account and we can use the testing of surfaces in two different ways basically you can use it just to test directly uh, before an event or perhaps even during an event to make sure that you have it. But that doesn't allow you to do very much changes with it within, within that period, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so of course, it's interesting to have some kind of approved surface, but you cannot get a, an approved surface without having complete control of the maintenance because you can change the surface in one hour going out there with a drag or, or, or your water, water tanker that can change the properties of the surface very quickly. So in this case, I, I'm, I'm really, uh, I really like the whole way that it's been setting up with, with, with racetracks in this country. And I think FEI needs to go in, in that way in the future too, to, to, to be able to do that. But what we can do at the moment uh, is two different things. So 
the general thing is to do benchmarking and I'm not going to go into all these, these details, but what you see here is actually all the European World Cup competitions last season, 22-23, and ending up with the... Uh, uh, no, this was not the last one. I see this is live. Oops. But I, I have one more where, where you actually had the final in Omaha last year. So this is a very uh, simple benchmarking of the surfaces. So again, this all of a sudden gives FEI an opportunity to say, okay, look at let's say London, we think you are high on both impact firmness and cushioning. This is perhaps not where we want to be. We're not going to argue about whether horses can cope with this or not. Just say that you're, you are sticking out a bit from the rest of the World Cup competitions. And, and, and because it's very, very critical to go in and tell that you have a poor surface because there will always be some top riders that say you have the best. Preferably the one who won, of course. <laughs> <laughs> so, so benchmarking like this and just giving feedback. And important discussions behind this is, of course, what we were just talking about. This is measurements the day before and the first day of competition. Basically, some of them I measured during the whole, uh, the whole uh, event. But measuring just during the just before there will just give you a, a, a momentary uh, picture of what you see. If you are in a very bad position, it's not very much you can do. And I can tell you for sure this was not from the World Cup, but I've encountered things like coming into big places, big, well established places. And they haven't prepared the surfaces for, for a competition, which is a huge difference from what they have to, really? to, to, today. Like an ebb and flow system, you know, ebb and flow systems, uh, it's, it's quite common in equestrian sport where you have basically your arena is a, is a bathtub or a swimming pool, uh, which is no slope within the drainage system. So you fill your bathtub with water and then you have water standing in the, in the bottom. Which is a good way to 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 actually create some um, uh, good cushioning and good responsiveness in the in the surface, because uh, yeah, how do you sure. create how how do you actually I mean I compared to this Wellington uh, example before, mm -hmm. but remember that very many of it, especially these ones which are temporary more or less indoor events that goes in <clears throat> installs the arena. Uh, in two days and third day the horses start working their fourth day there is competitions for three days how do you actually uh, both compact the surface enough to have enough cushioning while not making it too compacted that's yeah. a huge challenge it's a yeah, huge it's, it's, it's a huge huge, huge, huge challenge and and water is very very critical in this situation as it is in in, in all things but you're really having a having a challenge with being there on a base of concrete or tarmac or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> uh, again, I, I mean, this, this is uh, interesting. I like to, I really try to persuade people and it's important. I think it's important, but I like the whole general discussions around finding other methods, simpler methods than the OBSD, because the OBSD is quite a big piece of thing and you need some, some skills to <laughs> keep it up and running. Uh, we need to have something that gives good information for us and that can be used on a daily basis. Because what I see on, on, on a number of, of especially these temporary events is, yeah, <clears throat> on Thursday, when the first horses go, they could be a little bit to the, let's call it generally softer side. But some of these surfaces already on Sunday, they, you know, they have changed so much because if they should be able to compact enough in four days to be able to have <coughs> high level show jumping, they will continue to compact. Yeah. So on Sunday, they begin to be really hard. The worst thing with this is that, that the, the people putting in the surfaces, which are suppliers, and happily sponsor them. They sell this to training arenas afterwards. Does that make sense? You, you see where I'm coming? <laughs> it sounds like a golf. I mean, oh yes, I got the Olympic arena. Wow, oh, wow. Oh, you are an idiot. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> and the interesting thing is, it's really interesting to discuss with these 
top riders in the different disciplines because I, I, I don't think I heard any one of them who would say that I want to have the same arena at home to train on. No, they want to have something that has more compliance, less grip, is what they would call nicer to, to the horses. I mean, we are, we, we are facing, and, and this is different, I think, in the, in the different sports, but I like to compare the equestrian sport a little bit to, to, to motorsport. I mean, there is, we will get, when it comes to the surface, we can tune it towards performance, but we are increasing risk of injury. Speed kills. And it's the same with, 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 with horses from, from a general perspective. So I think this is a very important task for us. And, and that is definitely what lies in the future for FEI to actually find that, uh, that balance. So benchmarking is, is, is an important thing. Uh, <clears throat> I didn't find my, I, I was going to show you another thing. The other thing that FEI is using and has been using uh, since actually since the Olympics in Rio at all major uh, international championships is using the OBST and the testing procedure or material testing in the whole process from tender process. Uh, it's not always tender process, it depends on who organizes. In most cases, you would have a tender process. And uh, I would have uh, material coming in. I would do material testing, sending it to, to, to MixLab. Uh, I would uh, do track in a box test, <clears throat> give the results back. And actually not saying whether it's good or bad, but I'm just saying this, for example, has more or less uh, capacity of drainage, which is, could be very important way if you are in a very rainy position uh, or in a very dry dry climate uh, you give the information about cushioning impact firmness and so on you can explain what it means but it's really up to the organizer and an FEI to decide what they want because we are we, we are keeping ourselves within the threshold but you can have quite different surfaces <clears throat> while still being in, in, in this this threshold. And I think I think that is the way we, we should have it. it. It would be the same for for any uh, question discipline. You would see the same in, in golf. I mean, they would tune the golf tunes in in Europe when they have this uh, what is called the uh, what is the, the cup with Ryder. Ryder Cup. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, Ryder Cup. They would tune it for the European <laughs> players in, in Europe and for the U.S. players in U.S. Right. <laughs> and uh, I, I think we need to think about surfaces a little bit the same. The same same way but we should be able to give an objective evaluation of the functional properties mm -hmm. so uh, <clears throat> yeah so this is what i was taking it was talking about now so the tender process track in a box material testing uh, i mean it's so crucial that the surface is actually up to standard for FEI. So they spend quite a lot of money and, and also in the contract for, 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 uh, for, this, for the organizer, they would have to do not only the, the tender process, they will do full arena tests. If it's a newer arena, uh, we would go to, to the same surface put in somewhere else. Uh, and finally, they would be, there will be a test event, usually one year in advance of, of the Olympic game or World Equestrian Game, World Championships nowadays. And uh, during the test event, uh, we will also be there, not only during the event, but also uh, up to 14 days in advance to, to work out the optimal tuning of the uh, maintenance of the surface. Because even though you have exactly the same material, uh, the climate and the subground and everything else will affect how you should maintain that specific uh, uh, arena. There, there is no general protocol for, for arena maintenance. That is something that needs to be developed uh, uh, on an arena, arena basis. I think that is very important to understand. And it's basically the same procedure when then it's you have the main event. So up to two weeks in advance, we would start working with, with <clears throat> fine tuning, taking the learning from the test event and make sure that it is uh, consistent.
And during these events, it's also very important to, to uh, follow it during the whole competition. So, I mean, it's always interesting with these small, small things happening. <laughs> so, for example, in Tokyo, uh, I was working together with with Oliver Oliver Huber. We are I'm 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 there as a I'm there as a footing specialist. He's a footing expert. <laughs> the footing expert is the one who knows all the practical things. The footing specialist is just <laughs> evaluating it with with testing. But it's always a very very nice uh, and, and good collaboration. I mean, it, the challenge with with one of with big competitions like the Olympics. Uh, like in Tokyo, you would have a supplier who has won the contract through through the tender process. The supplier will make sure that it comes in the right material and so on. The supplier will still have a local uh, people. So in Tokyo, it was the uh, the uh, uh, racing people who who was doing a lot of the job because it quite takes quite a lot of of staff. And then, in this case, Oliver Huber is an official as a putting expert overseeing the whole thing. And uh, I'm also there as an official uh, and, and then just doing the testing of it. But, but uh, I was, must say in, 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 in absolutely a majority of cases, it's good collaboration, even though you could really have potentially some some uh, controversies between them. Well, and Oliver and uh, Christian are very analogous to the Track Surface Advisory Group. They're, 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 this, they're exactly the same role with RSTL being large. So anyway, we were, we were working. <laughs> in, in the middle, so, so it was actually a challenge with the surface in, in Tokyo in the sense that personally, I wouldn't have chosen the surface that was chosen in the tender process, but they were so uh, focused on uh, a surface that would be able to take a 100 year storm and being able to continue and uh, uh, continue, which simply meant that you need to have quite a coarse material that drains very well. And I've talked before about water, how important it is. And if you don't have a very coarse material, of course, it drains and you can't hold the water. So we water what you you can't imagine. I mean, we're talking about <laughs> we're talking about environmental <laughs> the amount of water that is used on, on arenas. I'm I'm kind of happy that it's not too much focus on that yet from the <laughs> general public. It was summer at that moment. It was summer. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so anyway, that, that was a really challenge. And then it was uh, the eventing. And so I test all arenas and also the cross country. So of course we can use, as we're doing here, the, the, the machine on every kind of surface you would have a horse on. But anyway, we were on the, for two days we were out there. And when we came back, we got quickly information. Oh, it's uh, the surface is uh, it's too, too hard. It's too compact. What is it? There is, it's not good. So I went out on the afternoon, measured it, and it was really, it was more compact. And um, FEI has actually been, it's, it's not until Tokyo that, that they actually made the reports from the OBSC measurements completely public to everybody. They were very afraid of, you know, they were very, very, very cautious. But then they said, okay, <clears throat> this is the way. And, and I said, I can explain it because it turned out that one of the tankers had broke down. So they had simply not been able to water another. So that was the, the reason. And the riders were correct. The surface has changed. Mm -hmm. So then, then I was allowed to go into the, one of the chef to keep meetings. And I explained just, yes, you are correct. Look here, we have the data. We had gone up from here to here. We know what it de depends on. We estimate that we need a, at least two days to normalize it. And then, any questions? No. And this is really one of the issues. I think sometimes I think <clears throat> one of the reasons that API actually pays a lot of money and also organizes that is especially when you get to 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 a world championship or something like everybody is like this and if it's not going like they do it's very easy to blame the surface and then this talk starts and uh, FEI really enjoys when we then can go and say yeah look we are within our thresholds mm. 
So there are quite a number of different ways to 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 yeah. to, to use use the machine, and this is a little bit of FDI. So finally, what I think is uh, what I want to mention then is <clears throat> I don't know I kind of prepared for that. That is, the thresholds today are <clears throat> based on wider opinion. But of course, the main reason that we are doing that, and from the very first video, that is about increasing <laughs> safety, of course, it's minimizing risk of injury, more specific orthopedic injury, while still maintaining uh, good performance. That's a big, big right. challenge. So <clears throat> what I also really enjoy by, by or like with what you see from, from, from especially in the racing industry, that's the uh, enormous amount of epidemiological data that you have. So, but you also have something that <laughs> I don't know if you're going to call it lucky or not, but you're lucky enough to have some measurable outcomes, and that is catastrophic injuries. So there is some, some, some uh, number of, of, of studies looking at, at, at health data or risk of injury in relation to surfaces. So epidemiological is, of course, the ultimate uh, kind of ultimate way to work with this. But it takes uh, years, many years, and a lot of testing. And we are not there uh, within the FEI structure yet. So what they actually done, and this is a purely FEI uh, financed study uh, that is ongoing as we are speaking. And that's an ex experimental study. In short, uh, <clears throat> we are taking 20 horses, going to uh, a place where I will be allowed to put in three very different surfaces. So I will create a high grip surface. I'm not going to tell you how. <laughs> we can take that at the coffee if anyone is interested. <laughs> I'm going to create a surface which has quite a, a, a high impact firmness, but a lower cushioning and a lower uh, responsiveness. So there is simply some elasticity and deeper layer. Uh, think of turf. The more I test, the more turf gets my gold standard from a testing perspective. And the just short explanation. So what you see in the turf is quite actually some firmness on the top, making a good support for the hoof. The hoof doesn't really rotate uh, completely. Of course, there's some give for turning and so on, uh, and for grip and everything, but the, the hoof doesn't, has a good support. It doesn't rotate uh, <clears throat> freely in the surface. But at the same time, so there needs to be some firmness in that part. But when you come to the maximum load, that should allow to actually distribute that load over the whole stance phase. Uh, so, so that is really interesting. So I want to create a surface that it is like that. And one surface that is the opposite, meaning that you have a low impact firmness. We spread out some loose top sand or basically a concrete base. Uh, and then we will use uh, state of the art, we will use uh, a, 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 I, I would need 30 to 40 high-speed uh, locomotion cameras, uh, policies, which I will do have suspended in the roof. I have set up this for, for some other studies recently, and it's really amazing. So putting markers on the horses, we can have markers even on the hoofs and have sub-millimeter precision within this whole, uh, in the whole volume. And uh, the next step, which is really interesting and hasn't been uh, done more than uh, in, in parts of horses, but that is to do inverse dynamics. Inverse dynamics see, simply means that if you have uh, basically a CAD model of your horse okay. and you drive that with your kinematic data from this locomotion analysis system, which then needs to have quite high resolution, of course, uh, you're able to calculate internal forces in the horse, meaning that we can measure the, or calculate the strain in the collateral ligament, in the suspensory, in the digital, digital and superficial digital fixed tendon, and so on. Look at joint moments. And this is, of course, doesn't answer the question whether the surface is good or bad, but it will give us good indication of what does different surface properties load, which kind of structure, anatomical structure does it load which of course will give us some indication that we can correlate to what kind of injuries do we have when we go in to look to veterinary databases. That's where we are and where we're going. <laughs> Thanks, Lars. <laughs>